All right, thanks for the invitation once again. So my name is Alessio Buccino and I'm an elect electrophysiology pipeline engineer at the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics. And in this talk, I will present a spike interface. So as you know, since you're at this course, <laughs> extracellular electrophysiology is a really cool technique to study the neural activity. Here, I just want to highlight that it's not only neuropixels. There are several different ways and different kinds of uh, electrodes that you can use to record neural activity extracellularly, both in vivo, like using tetrodes or silicon probes, and even in vitro, for example, using cell cultures, uh, brain slices, or uh, brain organoids. Here you have these uh, kind of planar chips where you lay down your sample. And then, of course, the mighty neuropixels that um, it's a great uh, novel probe and it gives unprecedented uh, levels of detail in recording this uh, brain activity. But in all of these cases, we need to uh, go through a very important uh, process that of course has been mentioned before, which is a spike sorting. And just to uh, recapitulate again, spike sorting is this essential, essential step that turns these complex and very high dimensional uh, raw data into a set of uh, spike trains that tells you exactly when the different neurons that were recorded by uh, your probe fired an action potential. So when I started my PhD, I used to do some tetrads recordings um, in rats, looking at uh, hippocampus place cells. And I started approaching a spike sorting and I wanted to see what was out there. And I soon realized that there was a jungle of spike sorters. Now, this was back in 2016. The situation is a bit better now, meaning that some of these tools are not anymore maintained or they're not used by the community. Probably the Kilosur fam family has taken, over, has taken over, but there are many other tools that have been developed and may work different purposes. For example, Kilosur doesn't work really well on tetrads, while it does on your pixels. So there are other tools that uh, are more uh, suitable for those kind of recordings. But in general, my first reaction, maybe the reaction of others uh, that started at the same time, was feeling a little bit lost, right? Because all of these tools uh, came with different requirements, different parameters, and so on. So with the um, international effort, we started a project called the Spike Interface. And now we've been running this for uh, six years. And it's a mature Python package that basically allows you to run multiple spike sorters on the same data set really easily. On top of this, uh, we built a lot of additional functionalities. So we have uh, many of the tools that Olivia presented before for pre-processing, batch channel detection, phase shifts, uh, drift correction. I'll touch upon some of these later. We have tools after spike sorting to combine the recording and the sorting and compute a lot of useful uh, additional data. We can compute quality metrics. We can do automatic curation. We can compare the output of multiple spike sorters. We have powerful data visualization, and we try to do all this pipelining uh, as reproducibly as we can. And uh, I'll give a few examples of what a spec interface pipeline looks uh, later in this presentation. So what we uh, set out uh, to do when we started spec interface was uh, getting over this basically initial paradigm uh, of analyzing electrophysiology data. So uh, when I started, we used uh, the OpenEFIS GUI to record our data. So we had to build a custom layer of code to read the OpenEFIS data and basically transform the data in order to feed it to a spike sorter of our choice. We wanted to try different spike sorters, and this actually took a lot of time. It was very error prone. And then the output also needed to be a sorter specific because each spike sorter outputs its own like spike sorted format. So with Spike Interface, uh, we tried to take a step back and we basically formalized uh, two layers, the recording layer and the sorting layers. So these layers basically allow you to read from many different file formats, both at the recording side and the sorting side. And uh, basically you can interact with these different file formats forgetting where the file came from, right? It has a standardized interface. And since this uh, interface is standardized, we can support many different spike sorters just by wrapping um, them into this spike interface language. 
And on top of this, we have now a lot of standardized, tested, and very community-developed uh, tools for pre- and post-processing, quality metrics, curation, visualizations, and uh, many more. As I mentioned before, we support many different uh, technologies. So uh, we support both Open EFIS and Spike GLX. So if you use NeuroPixels, and I guess you do or you will, since you're at this uh, course, we support both Open EFIS and Spike GLX. So you can read the NeuroPixels straight into Spike interface. I guess mainly all available Spike sorters that have been developed in the last uh, 10 to 15 years are supported through Spike interface, and you can run them with a single line of code. And also at the sorting side, of course, we can read all Spike sorting output plus more, like some software also do some online Spike sorting, for example, uh, Plexon uh, or Neuralinks, and you can read those as well. So as I mentioned before, Spike Interface started with uh, Spike sorting, but now it's a very uh, large project. Uh, it has over like uh, 10 different modules. I won't go through them uh, like right now for sake of time, but you can take a look at our documentation. We have um, all of these modules are uh, very nice, very nicely explained. Here's just a quick like uh, summary of what uh, different modules are available and what they basically do. So how does a spike interface uh, pipeline would look like? So let's assume you are doing a recording. You could use NeuroPixels or something else, right? The first thing you need to do is read the recording into spike interface. Then this is not true for NeuroPixels, but if you use some other silicon probes or tetrods, you might want to set some uh, probe information. For example, if you use tetrods, you want to tell the spike sources that you have multiple uh, groups that needs to be spike sorted separately, for example. Then we want to do some additional processing like a bandpass filter or a common median reference like Olivier um, introduced before. Then we can run it into a spec sorter like KiloSort4, uh, do some post-processing with uh, something that we call a sorting analyzer. We can compute uh, post-processing additional data and metrics. And finally, we can also export to Phi that you'll see uh, later is a very commonly used software for manual curation of spec sorted data. So these eight steps in spec interface literally translate into eight lines of code. It's a very high level API. So you see that in order to read the open ifis folder, you just need to call read open ifis. You can set the probe. Again, this is not needed for your pixels because the probe information is automatically uh, extrapolated from the data. We can run a bandpass filter from the pre-processing module, the common reference, and here's the catch. So you can run KiloSort4 with a single line of code. Then the output uh, uh, or the start of the post-processing is creating this sorting analyzer object, which allows you to compute many additional uh, features and data that could be useful downstream, including quality metrics, and we can finally export to Phi. So this is basically just a very brief overview of how easy it is to approach this complex uh, task of analyzing electrophysiology data, just because electrophysiology data is, is very complex in, in nature. And in the remaining of my uh, presentation, I will just uh, show you a few nice and cool features of spec interface that you might find useful, especially when using NeuroPixels. So the first is actually about uh, spike sorting. So if you try to run KiloSort, KiloSort 4, 2.5, or other sorter, you know that they have like, some of them, there's some complex installation procedures, some of them run in MATLAB, they need uh, GPU and CUDA compilation. Uh, so it's not that straightforward to run them. So in order to make things easier, we actually made uh, containers for all uh, available spike sorters. So a container is a piece of software that basically includes the software itself and all its dependencies, right, into a single uh, piece of software. Examples of these uh, container technology are Docker and Singularity or Obtainer. And basically, the nice thing, even for MATLAB-based uh, software like KiloSort 2.5 and 3, is that you can run them even without a MATLAB license because we have actually compiled them uh, for you. How to actually run it? It's exactly the same as before. You just run sorter, KiloSort 2.5, and you just say docker image equal true. And I just want to shout out to the Simons Foundation and Catalyst Neuro that spearhead this uh, containerization and dockerization of spec sorters. 
The next cool feature is uh, uh, data compression. So you'll see that uh, NeuroPixels data tend to grow very large. A single recording can be over 80 gigabytes per hour. And NeuroPixels next is coming uh, like uh, soon and it's gonna be even more data uh, per hour. And if we go to the in vitro uh, world, there are some probes that generate like hundreds of gigabytes per hour. And this data is actually large. And for example, if you store them in the cloud or even in uh, institutional servers, they actually cost money to store. And the larger they are, also the larger it takes to download them and to process them. So we have created a compression framework, which is based on the SAR. And it allows you to actually compress your neural pixels or whatever other format in spec interface with a single line of code. So you just define your compressor and then you save the recording into ZAR format by uh, compressing it. And you can also do it in parallel. If you're interested, we recently wrote a paper comparing different uh, compression strategies for electrophysiology data. And we found that audio compression works really well. And in particular, a compressor is called WavePack. And so we also made a Python package that allows you to use it uh, very straightforwardly. Another big problem that also was mentioned before is drift. So drift is the relative motion between the probe and the neurons. And drift is actually a very big problem for spike sorters because spike sorters assume that the waveform coming from the same neuron is similar uh, to each other, right? And so if we have drift, this is not true anymore. So there are many different uh, ways that one can go about to do uh, a drift correction. And we actually made um, uh, a module in spec interface and implemented the uh, drift correction into a modular architecture. There are seven, uh, several different uh, uh, drift correction methods and we actually summarized our findings and made a comparison uh, this year with uh, Samuel Garcia being the first author. But when it comes to spec interface, you can run mo correct motion from the pre-processing module and you get the corrected recording that you can pipe through this, it, like any different spec sorter. Then we have uh, in the quality metrics module, we have over 15 quality metrics that are implemented uh, and they actually allow you to automatically curate or assess the quality of your uh, spec sorting uh, outputs. Some of them are based on spike trains. Some of them are based on the amplitudes and the waveforms. Some of them are based on the PCA projections of, G of each spikes. We also have quality metrics to assess if uh, some units were drifty and so on, but uh, the idea is that these quality metrics allow you to characterize uh, each unit and make a decision on whether this unit is actually a good unit that you should keep for downstream analysis uh, or not. And the final cool uh, feature that I want to uh, briefly talk about is the visualization capabilities of spec interface. So Olivier showed something similar before, uh, view ifis. We also have a um, viewer that's actually, that works on Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks. This is the IPy widgets backend. And here, basically, if you run into, uh, in uh, Jupyter Lab, you can just uh, do this plot time series or plot traces, saying that you want to run it in IPy widgets. And then this gives you this very nice uh, and interactive visualization where you can scroll through the data, zoom in and out into different channels. And it's useful to check both the raw traces, different layers of pre-processing and also spike sorting outputs. A second very uh, cool backend that they supported is called Sorting View. And this was a project that we co-developed with the Flatiron Institute and especially Jeremy Maglan. And this is basically a cloud-based visualization. So when you use this backend, the plotting data is actually pushed through the cloud. And then the, the plotting function generates a single link that you can click on and with uh, render in your browser and you can interactively look at your data. So I have one minute left, so I will show uh, this very, very quickly. So here I have an example of viewing some row traces. So you can see we can actually loop through different uh, layers and this is only a link. So if I share the link on the chat and I will do it after the talk, you can click on it and you'll see exactly the same thing. And we also have a sort of a web-based version of Phi where you can actually loop through the units, you can plot their uh, waveforms, their amplitudes, and you can even do uh, manual curation. And this again, it works on a single uh, link. Uh, and the other 
cool uh, visualization tool that we are developing is called Spike Interface GUI. So this works straight off uh, Spike Interface uh, objects. And it's uh, another like uh, desktop application similar to Phi, but it's tightly integrated with Spike Interface. So it allows you to interact with all of Spike Interface functionalities, to compute additional stuff, to change parameters, and also to do uh, manual curation. Very finally, uh, uh, Spike interface is also tightly integrated with the uh, neuro data without borders. So it's a standard for neurophysiology data. We can both read uh, recording and sorting data from NWB files. And also it's integrated with uh, Den the Dendi archive, which is an open archive for neurophysiology data. And we can uh, read even directly from Dendi archive without the need to download the data. We can just stream them directly and interact with them. Uh, I want to give a very uh, warm thank you to all the Spike Interface team, which has grown a lot in the last uh, few years. So Samuel Garcia is the other co-developers, and then we have other five uh, core developers and over 70 contributors. So thank you really to all contributors and also to all the users that help us uh, uh, maintaining and improving this project. And since you are at it, if you actually want to stay tuned and support us, you could actually go on the GitHub repo of Spike Interface and start the project, or you can follow us on Twitter, X, uh, or Mastodon. And you can also check out our uh, YouTube channel if you want more in-depth uh, training and tutorials on how to use a Spike Interface. So thank you all for the attention. Start.